Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. We're live from EMC World 2011. Silicon Angle's continuous coverage. You can watch on siliconangle.com as the blogs flow through, and of course, siliconangle.tv, where all the, the video and live feeds uh, live. I'm with my co-host, David Floyer of Wikibon, and we're with Mike Feinberg. Mike, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you, Dave. So we're going to talk about Atmos. When I first heard about Atmos, it was this like, deep, dark secret, <laughs> right? You had the Skunk Works in Cambridge, and I don't know, David, if you were at that meeting. I was, was at that meeting, yes. It was in the uh, Science Museum. Yeah, in, and we uh, scoped out. We, we were and taking we were, notes like Hulk crazy. And Hulk and Maui, and uh, it was the greatest new was thing. It? And I think and, you uh, asked the hardest questions, I think, at that it was, point. Uh, <laughs> we asked a lot of them, that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, get that mic nice and close so everybody okay. can hear you. So, so, so um, you know, it, it was all about the excitement of, uh, of a new way of doing storage. Um, uh, you know, how's it been? Uh, what, what's the traction like? Yeah, what's it was a gleam in your eye back then, right? <laughs> and we talked about, what, what interested me the most is, is um, first of all, Tucci showed a little leg on the first day. So we got, we're in the cloud, baby. Yeah. And you know, Tucci, when he says something, he's got a pretty good track record. And then shortly thereafter that, you gave us a peek under the covers. And, sure, it, sure. and what was interesting was the design requirements, the, the billions of objects, the millions of users, that it really resonated with us, and then, of course, then you, then you had to go to market and deliver, and you're, I'm sure you're learning a lot. Yeah, what, what are you learning? What have yeah, you been so, finding? So I, I think, uh, to your point, I think Joe is, uh, was frankly instrumental in, in being the visionary of, we need to do something different here. And he put the team together, and I had the opportunity to lead the team to actually think about, how would you think about the billions of objects? And we used to call it the Carl Sagan uh, story, <laughs> uh, storage with billions of billions of <laughs> objects. And, uh, but the fact was, is that when you looked what people were trying to do, from an industry perspective and customer perspective, the technology we had didn't meet the need. So we actually had to look at the systems differently and when you took those notes, we really had a very good handle on what the architecture would be. Then we had to go execute on that. And, and, and the nice thing about Atmos is that we have introduced the product 18 months later into the marketplace, have been growing and shipping now for three or four years. And actually, thank you very much, uh, have been doing great traction with customers. And what you find, which is interesting, if what you find is this challenge of managing unstructured content across multiple data centers and managing at scale is across a number of industries, a number of verticals. Sure. And, and so what you might have thought was into this small part of the marketplace, and certainly we're seeing traction with our service providers that are trying to provide storage as a service or building services on top of that, but also in the enterprises that really have to manage unstructured content at scale. So, so, so where's the sweet spot in the market that you are going after? I mean, there are a lot of people out there, a lot of different technologies. Pretty hard to do business with those uh, service uh, providers, isn't it? Well, uh, where, no, the, the service providers are a great partner. So, I, of course, they're, <laughs> they're easy to do business <laughs> yeah, with. They, I they, they don't mind, uh, you know, you getting a big giant premium, right? They're not good negotiators <laughs> or any of those things, are they? <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. Yeah. But, but, no, here's the reality. If I think about what people are utilizing Atmos for, I think there's about two or three key use cases that I would highlight. And frankly, it is the service providers are really focused on how I can deliver storage as a utility for their customers. And that might be within their data centers or it might be across the internet. And that is recognizing that you have to have a multi-tenant environment. It has to support multiple sites and be tolerant across failure domains and really be robust because frankly, when the system goes down on the internet, uh, people might recognize that. And I think that's a first and foremost. <laughs> The second part of that is service providers are recognizing as they deliver higher level applications on top of these infrastructures, they need an Atmos-like infrastructure to develop it. So I would almost say that they're bifurcated on delivering a service based on Atmos and also utilizing it as part of their deployment of higher level services for their customers. So that's, that's one sort of leg of the stool, if you will, right. for the Atmos environment. Right. The other one, is what I would describe as the Web 2.0 or new application uh, programming paradigm. And frankly, if you think about cloud, and I, I would say EMC is doing a great job of addressing two of the com major contingencies or, or components of cloud. One is how do you take existing applications and get them to work in a cloud environment? And I think there are vBlock v -block capabilities is doing fantastic there. But what Amos is focusing is focused on is what is the new application paradigm? How do we write loosely coupled application where storage can be anywhere? 
and why that loose coupling is incredibly important is if you're over the internet and you make tight coupling uh, assumptions, you're going to have a challenge. So the REST-based interface to storage, people are rewriting their applications because they have to have content across the world in multiple data centers, and they have to do that in a way that scales from an administration standpoint as well as scales from a usability standpoint. So that's another leg of this tool. The third is, you know, we built a pretty good system to manage lots of capacity across lots of sites that does that without a lot of management requirement. That fits the needs of archiving. And we see a lot of people utilizing archiving based on cloud storage in particular uh, with Atmos. And, and if you think about just this past week, we introduced having the, the Centera and Xam APIs on top of Atmos as an extension of being able to have that archiving play on top of Atmos. Right. So yeah, this right. is a sort of three high level. Yeah. So it's a great use case archiving. Now, and of course, the, the catalyst was all, I presume, was all this Web 2.0 buzz back in whenever it was, 2006, and, and, and you're looking out and, you know, Tucci's pretty good at the gut feel game, and I think he saw that. But so that was a little bit of a surprise, I guess. That sort of the way in which Atmos and and, and cloud-based storage and object-based storage have been sort of permeating, right? I yep. mean, it it's surprised you a little bit, but um, but it's still it's still a niche. Um, I'm surprised that some of your competitors haven't jumped in as much. Um, I mean, we feel we felt for a while like this is just going to explode. What's the big barrier there? So, so I, I think there's a couple of things I would say, and I don't know if I use the word niche. Um, but I would say that it's homegrown in many of its usage. And, and so we got a couple of different things going on. If you think about the traditional storage industry, they're satisfying the enterprise customer. And the enterprise customer traditionally is focused on that transactional systems. Sure. And so we are seeing a transition from people just focusing on, trans, on transactional to more content related services and capabilities. And the whole notion of managing unstructured content is a scale problem. And so that takes some time to, to come to fruition. The enterprise is learning about that, and the leading edge of the people that are doing it have been these homegrown developers that are actually trying to, to change what the, how they've done things in the past. And so, in, frankly, the industry hasn't focused on them. We see lots of startups. The main levels of the company, you know, you do see competitive landscape, some people trying to buy companies that are, I would argue, repackages of other technologies now describing themselves as cloud storage. But the fact is, is being designed for cloud storage, it's really the startups, and I, I would say Atmos for all intents and purposes, and, and frankly, Amazon, right, and Yeah, Google. so you got an Amazon S3, sure. you got some other sort of cloud guys, I mean, Nirvonics is out there, you sure. got NetApp purchased by Cast, we'll see what happens there, um, and, and some others, but, but Atmos is really EMC, homegrown, yeah. I mean, you use some other technology as well, but it's an EMC, I call it a skunk works, is that a fair thing to say? I, I, you know, I, I think skunk works implies no one knows about it. When your CEO and chairman of actually knows about it, I don't know if that's a skunk works <laughs> or, uh, or more uh, a, a focused that's his, uh, startup. That's his skunk, that's uh, his. Skunk works. It's still it? Skunk Works, yeah. you think? So I guess by your definition, well, it's Skunk Works. Well, it was a, it was a, it was a, well, I guess you guys had facilities we, in Cambridge. I, you know, but in all kidding aside, I think we were very thoughtful about how do you incubate and innovate a business inside yeah, right. EMC. Right. And I, I have to be honest with you, I think that's a great learnings and great lessons learned by that. But to your point, I think Joe was very thoughtful, Mark Lewis was very thoughtful, very smart about, well, we don't need to put this as part of the core. You need to separate that out in a way that's meaningful that actually allows you to innovate and incubate. I own all parts of the business as we've gone and grown over the years. I don't own all parts of the business. I have to leverage the mainstream of EMC, which is a very good thing because I got a huge leverage point and consistency from my customer base. But it also shows how we've grown from the environment and how we are succeeding. Yeah, but to incubate, market. you don't want to make decisions that might be driven by maybe the need to keep you know an, an existing platform you know growing or you just wanted sort of that freedom Absolutely. to make decisions independent of that I, right? I, and I give you know as much as I like to take credit I, I have to give Joe and and the executive management team and mark in particular uh, a huge amount of credit for for setting me up that way to succeed so this idea of um, spreading storage out you know we made some announcements was, there and geo parity yeah. and, and and David you were talking about how that really dramatically cuts the cost, right? I mean, yes, uh, I mean, it, I was very interested in that announcement today because that, you, you, your claim was very good and uh, distributing slices of the data around the place yep. and not having to do so much, yep. like hold so much, something like half of it or 65% of it. I, tell us more about that. Uh, is, yeah. is that going to be a yes. very so, significant reduction in cost? Yeah, so I think a couple of things. I think it does a number of things at the end of the day. And just for clarity, what we announced today 
was an example, it was a production usage and, and people deploying this. It's not just PowerPoint. It's not just a thought process. Right, it's a product. But we have real customers, <laughs> real product deploying. And they're, we're basically taking one erasure code environment and an erasure code as a way of protecting the data by segmenting the data into data segments and parity encodings. And in Atmos, we have some flexibility of 10 data segments and two parity encodings for 10 to 12. 10 data segments and six parity encodings for 10 to 16, and also a nine and 12. And the reason I use the nine and 12, which is nine data segments and three parity encodings is because we had a customer that took four sites, 50 kilometers apart, and made one erasure coding data, copy of the data across those four sites. So 1.35 essentially copies of the data or, or capacity usage, and they got disaster recovery and tolerance to a site failure at any of these sites. And so when you think about a traditional DR, how would you, how many copies of data would you have to do for a uh, four site but, DR? You know what, I'm mad at my marketing guy. I want you to go, out. I'm going on record as mad at my marketing guy, because at the end of the day, the way we did the math was we said, okay, you, minimally you would have to have one, one copy at each site, so four copies of the data, right. and then you went down to 1.35, and it turns out to be that's the number we calculated. But practically speaking, you wouldn't, yeah, you, you you wouldn't have you wouldn't one copy, it. right? Well, You'd have at least more than one copy at, you, at, at each yeah, site. That's right. right. Yeah. So, I mean, so, I mean there are one of your competitors, isn't it? Yeah. It's Cleversafe, who's, who's been doing some of this, and they've been getting some good traction. Uh, with it, this. It, yeah, so, so we, we're seeing this, to answer your broad question, it's greater than 65%. We think that it, it's applicable not only to the 9 and 12 and the 4 sites, but 6 site configurations. There's a number of different right. configurations right. based on yeah. the encodings that yeah. make sense. We had to do technology to guarantee that we have even distribution of the segmentation, so there was data in all the locations and, and parity encoding so you could lose a site. Right. Yeah. So we did a lot of creative things to actually manage that fact of how people could utilize it. To your broad question, yes, we do believe that this is gonna change the landscape of how people are gonna think about disaster recovery. It's not just about active, active, it's active, 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 and reducing the number of copies. And we think that, in truth, you know, there is so many use cases for this, and you can take it to broader extremes of six sites and and you know and you can mix and match you may have two parity encodings across you know 10 of 16s across six sites because you wanted to have even more redundancy but it still can afford the cost so the flexibility this is going to provide for customers is great not just about talking about it not just saying it's theoretical in a powerpoint customers doing it they can tell you about it it's really very powerful so using some proven math mathematics to do this right um and, and there's some other IP that you're layering on top of that? You guys got, have you filed for patents in this area? Can you talk about that? Or? Well, certainly, uh, we are, oh, we, I'll, I'll say it a broad stroke, uh, we are always uh, focused on make sure that EMC and its shareholders are protected from their IP. Yes, you, you can, are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine that we're making sure that our IP is protected. Yeah, okay. Well, what about security in this area? I mean, obviously, you've distributed around the six places or four places, security must be uh, quite an issue in this sort of environment, especially if you want to intermix stuff between the different sites. Yes, yeah, so security. How, how are you tackling that? Security is a very interesting question in general in cloud storage, and I think that this is no, no, no uh, another example. So clearly customers can and may choose to actually not secure that environment or have the networking environment secure that environment, or they may ask, and many of the customers ask the outside people putting data into the system to encrypt the data. And when I mean secure the environment, I'm really talking about encrypting the data. Certainly so securing the system. Is, is encryption part of your algorithm? Is it uh, uh, we, built in there? Right now, Atmos is relying on either external people to do the encryption mm -hmm. and or some of the underlying systems. We are, in the future, enhancing uh, our system to have a little more encryption. In fact, in the geo drive that we announced has encryption into the, into the system. So it tends not to be, believe it or not, a concern that is necessi necessitates that the storage technology does it. It has to be in the system. And many, many, many customers actually want to have their own capability of doing the encryption and not having it as part of the underlying system. There's some obvious, I think you're well aware of, of, of laws in different countries that if you're yeah, right. managing the encryption and you're doing the key management, um, People may not be happy with you when you get uh, serve some uh, legal documents to, to sh serve up the data when you're going to have to apply. Let's, let's talk about a little bit more about an enterprise cloud, object-based, you know, REST interfaces. So, the the enterprises want cloud storage. We know that. There's some concerns about 
uh, uh, just putting all my data in S3. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen, we just saw recently Amazon went down. Yeah. We've, We've certainly seen security hacks. That's not going to not going to change. That's, that's not good news for you guys either, is it? The, the Actually, Amazon I, going down. Is I, it? You know, I, I, I'll, if you want to finish, I'll, I'll, I have yeah. a view of that. I, I actually think it is actually good yeah. news for these guys. I don't know why you'd say it wouldn't be. Why? why what's oh, your angle on that? Just because it brings down all of cloud. I uh, guess, but at the same time, yeah. it says, look, we need a better alternative. And if if, if I can trust a company like EM, pick it, pick your enterprise whale: EMC, IBM, HP, Oracle. I mean, if. If one of those companies is going to provide me a solution, I would think that I'm going to have more faith in that than, you know, Amazon is SLA. Joe Tucci said it best. It's like, you know, our SLA is we'll do our best, but if we don't, you know, <laughs> don't call us. Or Amazon recently put in, I don't know how many people know this, uh, a, a platinum level SLA. It's $180,000 a year. How many people could I hire, you know, or even outsource to, to India for $180,000 a year? A lot. So. So, uh, my angle would be it's actually a positive for you. I'm, I'm going to say it's a positive, but I'm going to say it in a slightly different okay. way. I, I actually think that the reality is, is I, and you're going to be surprised with this answer, so I think Amazon is fine. I think they did, sure, they yeah. had an outage. You know what? Outages occur. And I think the point that I would have and why I think it's fine is it does actually say why EMC is different in its approach. And the, the approach that we're taking is one is a bad number. In biology, one's a bad number. In you know, data centers, it's a bad number. And in, in service providers, it may be a bad number as well. <laughs> you know, the, the, end of the, the end of the day, you got to make the assumption that S is going to happen, mm. and how are you going to react and design for that? In fact, I would argue that's what we did with Ask Most. We designed that Stuff is commodity, it's going to break, what would you do? Take that whole design point of using cloud. So do I put data on my, my private environment so I can control it? Absolutely, that's some of, the, some of the answer. Do I use a service provider and make sure that I have some of it internal and some of it external? Absolutely. Do I rely on one service provider or maybe I use a multitude of service providers? And why EMC and allowing you to buy on-premise, allowing you to buy from multitude of service providers, we're enabling that capability of essentially understanding your fault domains and how you can manage it and just like in biology, you know, one's a bad number and having enough to, re, you know, procreate is, uh, if I can stay with the analogy now, I won't go too far, so don't worry about it. <laughs> That's right, this uh, is the cube, you can yeah. go crazy. <laughs> uh, you know, I think is the right answer, and I think we, the key though is in that environment, you don't want to have to have unique tools for every environment, and by having Atmos as the underlying core technology and the API sets that we have, that's critical, and, that, and that's what we'll be able to do. So I think it's a good thing. I don't fault Amazon. I'm sure some other service provider is going to have some other outage. Oh, sure. It's a fact of life. Sure. Let's deal with it and let's design around it. Yeah, but your explicit strategy with your service providers is to really, as I say, provide that enterprise class yep. uh, I, 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 and, and you know, explicit SLAs that are more enterprise level. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. that's what your service, service provider is going to do. I would presume things like auditing. I mean, I can't go on and audit. Amazon, I can, yep. and we have clients in Wikibon, they, they, they have no choice, they have to do that. What about a security incident? You know, I mean, how do I define a security incident? I mean, so many things that your service provider par partners have to deal with that Amazon doesn't. Amazon doesn't really care about that, right? And, and I think this is why we want to enable, and I think you said it well, the, the Amazon has done well for the developer community. The opportunity for all of us is the enterprise, and how do you go yeah. after the opportunity? Well, the last thing you want to do is, is, is put somebody in a position where they have to make a step function or cross the chasm. And you know, we, we all know that the yes, uh, any enterprise got a customer and say, what percentage of your data can go into the cloud? And you may get some number of zero can go into the cloud or 100% can go into the cloud or 50, 50 or 70, 30. What's the right answer? All of them. And so given that construct, let the enterprise guy who knows his environment manage that volatility of how much they want to put in the cloud. Give them the tools to do that the way they want to do that in the way. Maybe the auditing they don't like from the source writer, they're going to leave that on premise and they can do it. Maybe it's religious and it's not technical, but those are pragmatics. Yes, and absolutely. What, we're, and so, we're trying to be as pragmatic as possible. Yeah. And if I had a tagline, I would say we're allowing IT to say yes to cloud. And they can say yes to the architecture and how they acquire that cloud. That's really their option, and, and that's the flexibility. And so now, now a lot, now now the other attribute of, of cloud, of course, is pay as you go. That's another thing that, that S3 sort of popularized yeah. back in, you know, the early part of this decade or last decade. Um, now your go to market is largely with service providers, right? So they are in the business of pay as you go. That's yeah. how they're delivering this stuff. How about your your model? You have a shared model where where those guys are asking you to share in some of the risk, some of the pay as you go, and share in some of the reward, or is it more the traditional model? Are we not there yet? Yeah, so I, I, 
here's how I would answer the question. I think this is an emerging market, no, no doubt about it. And then there's all creative ways to actually go after this business and making the right business model considerations. The strength of EMC is the flexibility to work with its partners to give them the best model for their business. And whether they want to acquire the technology, they want to utilize it, we're, we're able, or lease and financial considerations, we have a, a strong gamut. Here's the practical reality. If you think about this business from a service provider perspective, scale matters and you want to get to scale. And once you get to scale, owning, you know, will probably be the asset will be the best way you're going to make the money. So it's like anything else. We have the flexibility and people have to pick how they want to go to market, how they want to do it when. And EMC is big enough and they have all those options. So, Mike, so, we have. Go ahead, so, dude. So, uh, so you talked about the chasm. You talked about what you're doing in that area, but what's your breakout strategy? Where, where, where are you going from now? What's the things you're focusing on? How do you get to that critical mass uh, of getting out? Yeah, so, so the, I mean, I think, I, here's how I would say it. You know, if I've been shipping for three years, you know, we see the right, nice revenue ramp that every year that we want to see. Our goal is to make very successful customers very happy, very referenceable, and being able to repeat. The absolute capability of the EMC go-to-market and the opportunity to have the reach is the goal and how to leverage that. And what I would tell you is if you think about it, though we don't disclose, if I was an external startup, I would be very proud of my first year revenue, second year revenue, third year revenue ramp. So I would be looking at, now, maybe not the Ferrari, but I would be certainly looking at the nice car as I felt Howard's succeeding. So I'm very optimistic about the, the growth. And you know, frankly, uh, if I could uh, say it one simple way, we just need to execute. We make happy customers, the rest will take care of itself. So, um, now Mike, we, we're getting your story, the vendor story, that's always good to hear, because you know, you're, you're at the heart of this whole thing, but we got a customer coming on next. Yeah. Now, uh, of course, they're coming into theCUBE, this is not rehearsed, he doesn't know what questions we're going to ask, so uh, we're going we're gonna to validate some of this stuff. But my last question for you um, is, for the, for the customers out there that want to go to the cloud, what's your advice to them? How should they get started? How should they think about this? So I'm not, that, I mean, it's, you would think that's a, a softball question, but I'm going to answer it a couple of different ways. One, there are those people that know why they want to go to the cloud. That's pretty straightforward. Just jump in and get going. They either are doing it for a new application development paradigm. They need it. They want to be able to take advantage of the bursting capability. What I would caution is for people to understand what they're going to get out of the cloud. So my number one thing is understand why you're going to it. Just because your neighbor's doing it doesn't mean it's the, for you. Practically speaking, I think if you look at the use cases that we're solving and how the marketplace is evolving and the introduction of device independence and iPads and playbooks and you know the Android, all that, it's obvious that the cloud is going to be an architecture that people are going to have to enable. And it's having a very focused approach on how you can exploit it so you can gain some early success and then have a repeatable success for your customers. So it's sort of obvious, I know, but it, you would be very surprised uh, maybe you wouldn't. Of how many I people wouldn't. say, <laughs> "Let's jump into the cloud"? What did no, you? What did you? And they don't even know what to do. I doing. wouldn't. I think that's great advice because a lot of CEOs out there are saying, "Just get get it to the cloud. Just yeah. get it there. Make it simple." And a lot of CIOs are responding, or not maybe not CIOs. They're a little bit more cautious, but a lot of organizations are responding. Hey, we have cloud. Yeah. You know, check. But that's dangerous, is what you're saying. So Absolutely. honest advice, I, I appreciate that. And I would tell you that EMC is very good at being able to explain the cloud and explain the the sort of bifurcation I talked about: new apps and old apps and We'll be happy, happy to help you. So, right. and by, my last comment, by the way, is it's always better to talk to a customer than the uh, the technology provider. And well, I, I look good, forward to this dialogue. Both is good. Uh, Mike Feinberg, Senior Vice President, General Manager of EMC's Cloud Infrastructure Group, um, one of the fathers of, of Atmos. Thanks very much for coming on the Cube. We appreciate it. Thank you All very right. much. Good to Thank talk you. to you. So.